um, you've had some experience here with, you know, with the flooding and uh, Austin had a huge flood and uh, North Dakota had uh, four feet of snow. <laughs> uh, go on and on. There's a huge uh, typhoon in the Philippines right now. There was another huge typhoon in China a, a couple weeks ago. Uh, these are the kinds of things you're going to see with, with global climate change. And uh, when you go to Gary Nahum's talk, he's going to be talking about all of the things that are happening in the dry desert climates and how that affects food production. Uh, I just finished his book uh, called Growing Food in the Hotter and Drier Climates. Very great stuff and a lot of stuff I'm incorporating into what we do because basically we, we're, in, we're in a high desert environment uh, on the Salt Mountain. We're, you know, eight, eight, six, 17 inches of rain. This year we got a lot more rain than we ever have gotten before. but. We didn't get it the way you got it in Boulder. We got it in a very nice, even um, increment. So it was very, very useful. And um, with perennial gardens, you, you hedge your bets against any soil loss or contamination. So that's, that's the advantage of uh, the resilience of uh, doing perennial gardens. Um, it's like the forest doesn't really, um, it can handle, you know, 10 inches of rain better than uh, providing, you know, there's some good uh, understory and there's, you know, there's, it can handle it better than um, say an annual garden can or a raised bed gardens where most of that soil just gets washed away. Um, I mean, raised beds are great and, um, but if you don't have any plants on them, if you don't have any cover crops, you don't have any way of holding that soil, it's all going to be going down the street. So that's another reason for, for doing perennial polycultures and um, having lots of different layers and heavy mulches, ground covers, um, cover crops, all that, so that you protect your soil. So here's some shots of the drought in um, last year. and. Uh, huge amount of uh, devastation. Uh, a lot of the farmers got bailed out with some crop insurance, but uh, across the world where there's a lot of drought, you know, people don't get crop insurance and, and it's not gonna help uh, more than one year because uh, this is what happened to me when they had four feet of snow up in um, North Dakota. We got about four or five inches of wet snow and since we had such a wet year, all the leaves were still on the trees and my whole forest garden was just hanging down. I lost a couple of large trees, uh, branches off some trees, but I had to go out there with a broom and shake, you know, shake all those things off. And fortunately, I didn't have any major damage, but you know, there's, you know, climate change can come in so many different ways. And uh, in the inner mountains, we're really protected, um, except for this, situation here where um, usually the you know all of our leaves were two to three weeks set back this year like even the changing of the colors was set back and, uh, and we're just starting to gather leaves now it's just two or three weeks later and and most of the leaves are off on of my apple trees and stuff but um, they were we were way late uh, but we, we got through it again um, there's resilience there. Um, and this is a shot of what happened here in Lyons, up near Lyons or up in that area. Um, we're not gonna, we just don't know what to, what to expect anymore. And I don't know how many of you heard about what happened in Austin, but uh, there wasn't that much press about it. But they had a huge flooding in, in, in the middle, in Texas as well. The greenhouses are a good way to protect your crops. Uh, these are some different strategies, uh, things that we go through to make it all work for us. And I'm going to go through some of our uh, greenhouses, uh, the five that we have on site, and they all have different climates. And then we're going to go through some of our commercial ones that we built uh, in Colorado and some of the climate battery technology that we built. Um, the first one is, is going to be uh, 
Shri, which is the temperate one, and we're going to uh, Mana, which is my attached greenhouse is Mediterranean. Uh, then we have a, an attached greenhouse uh, onto our cabin, which is temperate. And then Phoenix is tropical and Core is Mediterranean. We don't encourage people to grow, uh, to build a greenhouse that's tropical necessarily, uh, unless you, you know, you're ready to spend a bit of money uh, or do your homework. Uh, but you can do a lot with um, just uh, season extending um, lean-to greenhouses like, let's look at tree. So this is an, an, an attached greenhouse onto another greenhouse. It's actually western facing. This is a west wall here. And this is facing south. Uh, and it's just, you know, stuff I found at the dump and I attached it to the west side of my attached greenhouse, which is a Mediterranean greenhouse. But this is an early crop of spinach and brassicas. And then we harvest that and put in eggplant, tomatoes, and all kinds of stuff and grow stuff right up until we just, we just uh, cut all the tomatoes out and they're on the counter now ripening. Uh, it's kind of nice to have all your tomatoes out there. And you walk by them every day and they're, every day there's new reds showing up and yellows and stuff. And so we grow all our, you know, a lot of our tomatoes in these four season or these two season greenhouses because uh, I don't like to grow them in the tropical greenhouse. Um, and then we use that for wood storage. We use it for worm farming. Uh, we do uh, right now we're drying our grain from the brewery in there. So there's lots of different uses. And then after that summer crop gets done, we just cut it down, throw it on the ground, leave it on the bed there, and then put some stable cleanings on it. And then we put uh, some leaves on it and pallets on it. And then we can use that space for something else. Uh, I bring my nursery in there in the springtime and wake it up and then I can graft on it. So this little space um, is very, very valuable. And most people, you know, would have a shed like this and it would just be full of junk and it would never get used, right? So we're using these things over and over again, different ways, and this is the cheapest and the simplest of greenhouses, but it's pretty, uh, my architect partner wants me to tear it down because it, he thinks it's an eyesore and he says, we can never sell one of these, you know. Uh, you know, we can never, you know, sell one of these for a million dollars, so, you know, so I'd say, well, you know, <laughs> anyway. Then this is my attached greenhouse. This is the second greenhouse I built. Um, it has a huge fig tree in it. Um, we plant a lot of insectary plants here to attract beneficials to go inside and bring in our beneficials for pollination and, and insectary biocontrol. And there's a 6.3 kilowatt power plant on the top of the roof. And it's also a passive solar home. So there's lots of layers of of resilience there, uh, you know, passive solar home, it doesn't need to be heated, um, has a greenhouse on it. Uh, the realtors would never have uh, allow you to do that here in Boulder because there wouldn't be any resale value for your house, but um, that, I've had it there for about 20 years. So early on, we grew a lot of annuals in here before the fig tree took over the whole place. And we still do some things in there, but this is tomato crop in the summer and it would be, uh, you know, some brassicas or salad greens in the wintertime. Again, this, this greenhouse is allowed to freeze out. And see, you know, the fig is actually <laughs> taking over the whole greenhouse, but we still do things. We have rosemary, uh, pomegranate in there, and then I bring in nursery and wake it up. Uh, so we put pallets down after we chop and drop everything. And so there's, there's a worm farm underneath the pallet, and then there's, bedding, there's nursery plants there. And we have about five months of fig season, and we freeze a lot of figs. And, um, this is a similar greenhouse attached to our cabin. Again, about $1,000 it cost me to build this. The only thing we bought was the rafters. Everything else came from the dump. Just recycled wood, uh, and it's a double inflated poly, which is two layers of six mil. Go ahead. Inside we grow, um, assortment of herbs and there's some perennial herbs in there and uh, again rotating summer crops and fall crops. Right now actually we're just growing one summer crop in here. 
And uh, if you can see on the left side, we, uh, we do our legal uh, intercropping uh, of three plants. <laughs> and they grow really well with, uh, it, that's uh, tarragon at the bottom and there's kale and, and there's comfrey off to the right. And then, you know, we're just actually jarring up the stuff now. This is our new project. This is a, a hybrid hoop house. You know, a hoop house would be totally glazed on all sides. And so we, we used the steel, which I salvaged uh, 15 years ago, and it was just uh, piled up above where the greenhouse is now. And then we, um, this is south facing here, and this is east. It just happens to be along the road here. And uh, there's venting here, there's a sliding glass door there. And uh, the west wall is uh, insulated and the north wall is insulated. And let's go inside. There's gutters that will go into the, to the totes here and fill up for water collection. You see the, e the west wall over there is insulated with vents and the north wall is insulated. This is a typical hoop house that was salvaged uh, from a big project. So a lot of times you can get free hoop houses or 10 cents on the dollar. And uh, this is still under construction. So I'm gonna be putting figs on this side of the five different kinds of figs that will be growing here permanently. And uh, in the other beds, I'm gonna be growing worms and then putting pallets on there to do nursery stuff in the spring. But this summer I'll be growing probably uh, low-bearing papayas in there with spilanthes and maybe a few other herbs, you know. Avocado. I have uh, avocados in the tropical greenhouse, four varieties, yeah. They haven't fruited yet, but uh, they're, they're getting too close. They're about two or, two or three years old and we're shaping them. Um, there's a problem with pollination. There's, that, that's a problem in the greenhouse. It takes a while to sort out what's gonna pollinate it. And, uh, but we'll figure that one out. It's wind pollinated generally, but we can. Jerome, yeah. Uh, on the fig trees that you're going to put in, put in on the right side there. Yeah. Uh, is that uh, bins of dirt or? Yeah, that's a bed. That's a deep bed of, of, of basically um, hygge culture. There's wood and a combination of different materials in there: stable cleanings, leaves, uh, rotten material. Um, Do you have a earth? Yes, there is, there's a climate battery, there's a climate battery in, in, in the floor. Uh, the exit is here, and um, there's even some pipes in the beds. So, yeah, it's connected to the, to the ground. So these are really deep raised beds, like three feet deep raised beds. So all of the plants will be in some really rich soil. And that's, that's what we do is we build these, you know, high beds with very rich soil with sheep mulching, basically. And this is my very first greenhouse. Uh, it was subtropical. Any, it wasn't anything like uh, Phoenix, but it, uh, it did work. I, I had this for 25 years. I grew all kinds of different things in it and learned a lot, made a lot of mistakes. Uh, you see bougainvillea, basil, bamboo. There was bananas in here. And again, it was seasonal. It was actually a, a, a market. We grew basil and salad greens for 10 years in this greenhouse to support our market farm, which all of my acre outside was not perennial, was annual. So we did a 10 years or, or more of, of, of market farming. This is a, I still had a pebble beach in there with a hammock and a solar shower. Uh, you can see this is another ginkgo and brassicas during the spring, chayote, jujubes. Here's a mistake, I put some grapes right in the middle and that kind of messed up my air drainage so you know you got to be careful where you put things so you don't block your air drainage so then we had a fire and um, it was caused by supposedly a rodent in the roof of the sauna which is the sauna was right here and the new sauna is in the same place that was the climate battery fan over there that's what we did that was the second climate battery that was built in Colorado and we just used swamp coolers, and there's pipes down to three feet in that soil right there. And we used all the same pipes again. We were able to add two more courses on there, and you'll see that. That all had to be cleaned up, and I, bought, I got a steel from another greenhouse, and I rebuilt it. 
and that's what it looked like now. And that was um, all free steel from another greenhouse that was, um, and we used polycarbonate and uh, put in an improved climate battery. We just put in a pallet stove, which is more redundancy. So we have the thermal mass, climate battery, and the sauna, and then we have a pallet stove in case we don't want to do the sauna. I've already started doing my saunas and doing my Bikram's yoga in the sauna. So this is how my partner uh, is in ecosystem design. Um, we measured all the steel that we got from this greenhouse and he designed it on SketchUp. And uh, we just put a new foundation in over here, you can see, with the big feet and sauna tubes. <coughs> Again, I used all more conventional material and from this greenhouse, we launched our ecosystems design company where we've done some pretty large scale greenhouse projects that you'll see. But all, uh, all the experience that I, I got from doing you know, the Palais greenhouse um, 20 years, all went into what we're doing now. So we started very really small and I still keep everything pretty small and I still build from salvage. That uh, core greenhouse you saw, the hoop house, that's 75% salvaged. Uh, so we just find stuff, we go to the dump, we stockpile stuff. And um, this is what we stockpiled from, uh, to build this greenhouse. And this is the first SketchUp uh, design. We had to go out in the snow and take some elevations and then um, we use Google Earth and uh, you can design our projects that way. And we've probably done about 25 projects in the last five years. This is the pile of steel that I brought up. Um, that was the original greenhouse, and this is what I brought up on my road here and with, a horse, with my uh, boat trailer. And this is the greenhouse sitting out there ready to be um, put together and put on a new foundation. This cost me about it's a, probably about a $250,000 greenhouse when it cost me about $70,000 to put it up with the new material we bought. And we had lots of you know, interns showing up, uh, climbers uh, putting the steel together. We had to buy some new parts. But basically, uh, you, you, it's like a rectory set. You put these things up together and in the parking lot, and then you just stand them on these things and support them and weld them right there. and then. You put the purlins on and uh, everything ties together and the walls. So it's really kind of a rectory set, you know. That very structurally good and, uh, you know, this, this steel is already 30 or 40 years old, but it's good for another 100 years probably. And uh, again, it was just a bunch of volunteers. It took us about two years, to, no, about a year and a half to do it. Uh, but we were building a, a, three, a three quarter of a million dollar greenhouse in Steamboat at the same time, and we finished the same, the same week. And they had, you know, interior designers, architects, contractors, you know, architects, everything, and we just had our volunteers, right? So again, you know, you don't need, you can do it, you can do it on your own. Uh, that's my architect partner there. He, he came and helped uh, when we had some difficult times. Um, so he designed all these sit panels to fit all of the structural stuff right there. All very tight and uh, that's 10 inches of insulation there and 6 inches in the wall. Now uh, what's nice about a re rectangular greenhouse is that you can add things to the north wall. Uh, on the left of the slide there, that's the sauna as you go up to the steps. That's attached to the greenhouse, okay? Then we have a woodworking workshop attached to the north side of the greenhouse. Then you come out on a deck and then you have a wood burning hot tub there. And then this is all landscaped in a, into a vineyard now. A yoga studio up on top there, a solar dryer and a dining area. All tucked on the north side of a greenhouse. I mean, there's a potting table on the other side. So, you know, in permaculture, we, um, we like to just stack everything, tuck everything in there, get as many uses out of the spaces as we can. And this is a very good example of it. And the pond's just on the other side, and the forest garden. And that's what it looks like 
that's a pinion and juniper ridge there that helps protect me from the northwest. This is the west end of Phoenix, and that's the forest garden uh, dormant. It's good to organize uh, all of the functions of your greenhouse in uh, this mind map technology. So we're looking at uh, temperature regulators, and we have the climate battery, and we have venting, sauna, doors, rock walls, terraces. So uh, then we have scented plants over here, which are also insectary plants. And recreation, hammock, patio, archery, it's not in here, sauna, uh, yoga studio. So we don't want to have just a, a house for plants. We want to have a house that's, that's an ark, that's something that we can live in. And you know, I even have a sleeping platform and a, up in the, tucked up in the corner and there's a fire pole that comes down if I want to get down in a hurry, taking naps and stuff. Um, it's really important to, to create something that you can use you know, year round and uh, you don't have to go to the tropics that often. So these are some of the functions of Phoenix. And after the construction was up, the, the shell was up, we started uh, doing some raised beds in here with rock storage and putting uh, another layer, two layers of climate battery in. Uh, this went on top of the original climate battery, so we had uh, additional pipes. That's the intake here. There will be a, a riser here and a f fan that pulls the hot air into the soil profile and all these pipes will go in here. Basically the hot air, the, the hot air comes in, this, this, there's three intakes and the hot air comes in here, moves through the pipes. This is a lot longer than it looks. And um, then it comes out cool and dry in, in that. Uh, there are three intakes and three exits on this greenhouse. But our commercial ones are much, uh, you'll see, they're much more substantial. Where does your hot yeah. air come from? Where do you think the hot air comes from? Go outside and El Sol, yes. That's a good, I mean, get that question. I'm wondering, you know, where does hot air come from in a greenhouse? And you don't, see, right now, um, we only have to open the, the, one of the doors for about an hour and a half. And all the rest of the time, in this transition period, in the wintertime, the greenhouse stays closed all the time. The climate batter actually cools it. And instead of throwing that heat away, it, we pump it in the soil. And there's one thermostat that kicks it on at 70 degrees to charge the soil. And then there's another thermostat that kicks it on at 55 degrees to discharge the soil. And um, I, don't th I think Chris is here, um, and he's uh, good. Uh, we've got a couple of slides on his um, electronical. We, we have another, um, Chris is being, uh, I'll bring him up here when we get to that point. Um, so we've done this thing with just simple thermostats. And then Chris contacted us and we wanted, uh, we've gone digital on it. Not in my greenhouse yet, because we didn't get a grant to do it, but on our other projects, we're switching to digital. This is the original climate battery, which is just a wooden box down here. And that's how I used to build them 25 years ago. I put one in France. Uh, that's, the, that's the intake. And now you, it's, it, the soil is about up to here, though. While we were building and while we were building soils and finishing the climate battery, we were growing all the plants that we were going to grow that year in pots, in one gallon pots, two gallon pots. So after we were ready, you just put it right in. And uh, in June, July, I think it was, in both greenhouses, and then in a couple months later, we were we had tomatoes up to the ceiling, you know. How deep do you bury the pipe? Well, there, this one's got down to six feet because uh, I have two, two different systems, but usually three feet. We were able to connect the old pipes uh, because we cleaned them out and, and put them here. And these are the old ones, there's the new ones, and this is the exit. Go ahead. You'll see a lot more of this. Chris, why don't you, uh, why don't you come up here and uh, talk about your your controls. I'm uh, Chris Ditson, and uh, I've known Jerome here for about a couple of years now. And I was just really inspired when I found out about Crampy and, and uh, what a wonderful place it is. And if you haven't had a chance to visit up there, 
Um, well, I said if you haven't had a chance to visit Crimpy up there in Basalt, it's definitely worth the trip. It's, it's really uh, just an amazing um, experience. And um, I have a background in um, uh, control systems, you know, audio, video, and, and uh, building control systems. And so once I saw what was going on with the climate battery technology, just to give you a little bit of a background on this, someone had approached me about designing a more efficient greenhouse. Um, and uh, when I was young, I used to live in a teepee. And I was aware of the fact that when you're living in a teepee um, and it's really cold, I was up in Grand Lake where it was like 45 below zero a lot of nights and, and like that. And I was pretty warm in this teepee because um, I was burning a fire. You know, I had an open fire and uh, I'd burn all the time. And um, you know, the, the fire pit is built out of rock. You know, you have, you build, uh, you line your fire pit with rocks. And then what happens is that, you know, the, the intense heat from the fire heats those rocks, which in turn heats the soil. And so the entire floor of the teepee becomes quite warm. And so even though you've got like, you know, four or five feet of snow outside and it's really cold, it's actually quite warm in the teepee when the fire's not burning. So when I heard about the, um, the climate battery, which just simply draws warm air out of the uh, greenhouse, which can, can actually get quite hot, you know, during the day, even in the winter, and pumps into the soil and heats that soil all throughout the entire floor of the greenhouse, I realized that that's a very viable technology. And so that's what, uh, that's what Michael and Jerome are doing with, uh, with Eco Designs, is they're um, coming up with a uh, very cost efficient way to heat a greenhouse and, and um, allow you to have um, year round planting without having to burn a tremendous amount of fuel. There's a uh, gardening center here in Arvada that I was talking to that um, keeps growing year round to keep their staff going and everything. And their utility bill is $6,500 a month during the winter. Yeah. You know, so we're gonna start working with them a little bit to see if we can't um, employ some of these technologies to, um, to uh, um, help them get a more efficient way of, um, of um, um, heating and cooling their greenhouse because the climate battery also cools a greenhouse during the summer. And, uh, but to make a long story short, this is, a, uh, this is an energy management controller that we just built for a, um, a greenhouse up in South Dakota. And it, uh, it basically controls the climate battery fans and turns them on and off. There's four big fans in this place for climate battery. And there's a half a dozen called uh, horizontal airflow fans that move the, uh, the changes in temperature from either your backup heater or your climate battery <coughs> moves it laterally in the greenhouse to keep, you know, you know, keep the airflow uh, consistent and so you don't have any hot spots and anything. So it basically um, automates that process of uh, when those fans come on and turn off and how they run that type of thing and then additionally controls the, the venting system. And this is something that Jerome taught me is that venting is number one in a greenhouse. It's like the most important factor to um, to uh, greenhouse management is, is uh, successful venting. And so, you know, Jerome is like, is like this climate battery controller times 10, except that has to do everything by hand, you know, and, and runs around the greenhouse constantly. Not really, not that much. We get it down to where, you know, we kick the door open if we need to, or, uh, um, you know, I turn on the circulation fans. Um, I've been able to actually cool my greenhouse in the summertime with no, no electricity, just with canopy, with passion fruit, and now we've been using lima beans. Um, so again, instead of having circulation fans on when you don't need them, um, you know, we're, we're not using them only 30% of the time now. I've got them on right now because um, this time of the year when the greenhouse heats up, instead of having all that, I don't expect exit it out of the upper vents, but um, I circulate it back into the climate battery. And so, and, but also I keep it moving because, uh, you know, and funguses and, and stuff like that. But for our commercial greenhouses, we were using Wadsworth controllers. And this is an alternative to Wadsworth. And um, we're going to see where this goes. I think it's going to be cheaper and, and you can uh, monitor it from offsite as well. Yes, this is fully data capable, so you can um, have a web server and be able to observe the um, the uh, functioning historically over time of um, the you know temperature, humidity, uh, carbon dioxide, whatever measurements you want to take in the greenhouse. Uh, plus, also automating all of the energy management processes, and then being able to optimize them based on historical information and automate the optimization process and so on. And um, 
this this particular uh, device is designed to be affordable for small greenhouses, which we're finding is is the, you know the majority of them. And my personal philosophy is that you can solve all the world's problems by growing your own food, and so that's my mission in life is just to support getting everybody to grow their own food and hopefully this will help. So uh, this is the original. Uh, wooden box that was my plentum. That's, these are all the original pipes that uh, we just built a wooden box and painted it. And it was all rotted out after the fire. So I, you know, it's like a wooden boat. If a few planks are rotten, you just, you know, you take them out and put new planks in. So this is all you know, scrap wood that I put in and, and put the new climate battery right on, two more courses right on top and the new fans and stuff like that. So again, just using and repairing what things what, what we had. This is the, the little climate battery that goes in the sauna. So it has its own climate battery. There's a really high-tech fan that sits up here. These are the benches here. And this has gravel and flagstone on it. And the big stove is sitting over here. So I'll charge the floor for about five hours, you know. Um, so the floor is really warm as well. So it's extra thermal mass. There's, Five inches of concrete on the other side with marble. So there's thermal mass, there's 10 inches of insulation, foam insulation on the, on the walls. So that thing heats up to be um, like 130 degrees and it stays warm for 24 hours. So that's just, that's just a little climate battery in the, in the sauna. And it's really important. See, this is uh, the marble, scrap marble. And you can see the, uh, the gravel and the sands sandstone floor. It's like walking inside a masonry stove. Uh, and you're, you know, there's the bench I do my yoga on. And uh, you know, it's, it's very, it's, I, I taught some workshops in Finland and they live in a sauna. You know, they basically, the first thing they build is a sauna. Uh, the young folks do and then they build their house around the sauna. Uh, but I, you know, I I really enjoy this. Uh, it's part of this, the, uh, the whole ambiance of the greenhouse is to be able to heat it with. We have about five cords of, of free wood. Um, some of it's really nice wood. Usually we just scrounge around and get all kinds of cotton wood and, you know, but just this year we got lucky and got some really good wood. Ventilation. Uh, you know, in real estate it's location, 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 and in greenhouses it's ventilation, ventilation, ventilation. <laughs> So you know, these are uh, vents on the south, and we have equal number of vents on the higher on the north, so that you get good ventilation. Also, the pollinators will come in, you bring in all the bees and the wasps and the beneficials and the hummingbirds, and all those pollinators will come in and come in and do your work for you. Then uh, this is the passion fruit here. It was grew here for a couple of years, and uh, this all gets shaded. So in the summertime, you don't want the sun on on your thermal mass. Uh, in the wintertime, we cut all that back, and then the, the sun angle comes in really low and hits this, and hits the patio here. Um, and we have our pallet stove right there now uh, that we're, so we have one more um, opportunity to heat the greenhouse so we have more redundancy. It's shading, and the, all the bananas and all the figs in the greenhouse intercept the sun, and so, and the extra um, heat goes above that and exits the greenhouse. So it's actually, this is a cool room in, 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 the, in the summertime. It's cooler in here, right here than it is outside all summer long because there's ventilation and, and, and it's cool. So that's, again, a lot of energy is spent to cool greenhouses in the summertime. And I, I spend zero energy. I turn all my circulation fans off. I mean, this only happened last year. I just sorted it out, you know. Okay, we're going outside. We'll come back to greenhouses. But uh, the diversity and redundancy in a forest garden, this is a perennial edible landscaping, perennial polycultures. Uh, it all goes to sleep. These are, uh, these are some of the gills, um, 150 varieties of fruits and vegetables. Uh, new things we had this year was mulberries and uh, lots of mulberries and lots of Asian pears, and it all goes dormant. And this is outside, Asian pears, mulberries, uh, 25 varieties of grapes, all winterized. They're all good to 15, 20 below zero. 
So there's so many plants that we could be growing outside in a polyculture food forest that we aren't doing. There's even an additional microclimate here. Uh, when the sun hits this water, there are huge rocks, terraces up here. And in the springtime, there's no foliage there. It's all dormant. So it, it warms up those rocks. So you get a, a, like a zone six and a half, seven up there. We've got hazelnuts up there and uh, Asian pears, uh, persimmons. There's ducks and lilies in the pond. So there's lots of ways of creating additional microclimates in addition to just being in the microclimate that we're in. Again, these are just some of the harvests that we have on a daily basis during the summer and fall, and we're still harvesting apples and uh, pears and stuff, plums. We have 20 varieties of apples. They all fruited this year. Uh, 15 varieties of plums. Mulberries, um, Gerhard was overeating these mulberries, and this, this fruited for about three months. Solid mulberries every day. I have about five, five or six different types of mulberries. But this was the best one and the longest fruiting one. Uh, they, they would get almost black. They turn out white, and they just. And then we had, you know, five or six different kinds of sour cherries, and but they were very sweet this year, because we used uh, compost tea, and so we got the brinks, the brink level up really high, on our, um, on our fruit. It was the sour cherries were like sweet cherries, because the sugar level was so high. Brought it to what level on them? The Brinks level, uh, the sugar level, sugar Brinks. content level. And that's, that's an indication of a very healthy plant when the Brinks level goes up. And it's, these are some of the grapes. Uh, I have th this, this variety of grape crawls all the way to the top of a pinion tree. Uh, we didn't even get to harvest all the grapes this year. We have 20 different apricot trees, and they were all fruited this year. That's a grafted variety. I have about half grafted and half seedling. Um, I had one tree that, very small apricots, it didn't fruit for 20 years. And I was ready to cut it down. And finally it fruited. It's about this big, it's a seedling tree. So the graft died, I just, you know, getting around, it was in a section of the forest garden, I just let go. And I was, you know, kept wanting to cut it down and maybe graft onto it. And it had the sweetest apricots on it, little small apricots, but they were really nice and sweet. So again, you just have to have patience and just let things, uh, it takes a long time for some, some fruits. And we never had a lot of water in the beginning. Garlic is a, is a weed in my garden. And this is, um, this is a weed patch of garlic that uh, a couple of bulbs were left in. And uh, this, but actually, I can harvest pretty large garlic out of that. Uh, if, and each year, they get bigger and bigger. This is a shot of looking up at one of the apple trees. and grapes over here. There's five different grapes up along the pathway going up uh, on the east side of Mana. Uh, there's, there's a grape crawling up on the Siberian pea shrub here. Uh, there's another grape meeting that one. Uh, there's comfrey, astragalus in there, mints. Uh, again, it's a jungle. It's a food jungle. And it just goes on and on. This is a blue dancem plum that's very reliable. And it uh, it just fruits every year. We have two blue dancing plums, and there's a Macintosh apple in the middle uh, behind it. Bartlett pear, and I uh, had great luck with Asian pears. That's Asian pear on the left. Three or four varieties fruited this year. And then we, we, uh, we've been bringing in mushrooms. When I go on my walk, I just found this a couple days ago, and I think it's a chanterelle. It was growing in one of our swales. Uh, I'm not sure. This, uh, that's a meadow mushroom. And that's, that's the psychedelic mushroom that was just growing out. We're using these, uh, these cottonwood logs to retain beds or to build terraces. And you stand them up, lean them in a little bit, and just throw uh, stuff in. And then you can build some really fast, cheap beds. Uh, and that, that supports my mulberry tree. Again, mycelium is a really important thing to get in your forest garden and in all your soils. We, and I don't buy it anymore, I used to, but I just go on my walks, I just bring back the mushrooms I find, because this year was a good mushroom. Um, some are edible, some not, doesn't matter. They're all just part of this whole breaking down and uh, working with the soil and working with the plants. Animals are really important in our, um, 
We have ducks. Uh, Nutrient-rich water from the pond was uh, really helped, I think, bring the sugar levels up to, plus the compost tea. That's the spent grain from the, from the beer works and the brewery, and uh, we feed our animals exclusively on that. Uh, and plus, they get uh, trimmings and they get uh, alfalfa and uh, weeds. And so I have like these free-range rabbit trees, and I have some turkeys in here as well, and chuckers. And these are the wild turkeys outside. They just came over to see what was going on <laughs> with my turkeys. Um, and one year, I, when I let my turkeys out, I had the wild turkeys come in and they mentored them. <laughs> it was pretty neat. They taught them how to fly. And wow. What predators do you have to worry about there at Trimpy? And, and what are your methods of, of uh, keeping them out of your turkeys and your rabbits and so forth? Well, we have the, our pins are pretty secure, but I. Uh, we do have bear problems. I shot a bear in, in the spring. Um, it was kind of, uh, it wasn't intentional, but it, it, uh, I shot a bear. Uh, I, I, you know, it's, it's another story, but I, I didn't get, I didn't get fined. Um, and if there's another bear there, if I get a license, I would harvest that one. I had to give the other one to the DOW. Do you have, problem, do you have cougar there also? Pardon? You have cougar as well? No. We have cougars. I think we lost some chickens once for, for, from a cougar. Uh, we have skunks. You know, I, we do lose a occasional, but um, we have very secure uh, lockups at night. This is another pin where uh, these rabbits are eating spent kohlrabi or some, some stuff from the, uh, you know, from the garden. Instead of putting it in a compost pile, we run it through the rabbits. And then we bring in all kinds of sawdust and spent hay or whatever, or what they don't eat, they manure on it. And we, this gets about six inches deep, then we clean it out. Then it goes around the trees or it goes in the greenhouse to make worm farms. So we're recycling carbon. We're, we're, carbon, um, we're collecting carbon for free, and, and we're bringing it in and value-adding it with animal manure. And they're using it, they're eating. It's like I throw a bag of leaves in there, they'll eat a quarter of the leaves as their own food. And then they manure on the rest of it. Then we gather it up, put it into worm bins and whatever. And so animals are very important uh, to micromanage them. That's what we do, uh, small animals. And these are some new, um, we put on a lot of new trees as well. Uh, there's a mulberry tree on the left side and here's another plum tree. That's elderberry. Hollyhocks are a weed, so we let Eye hawks come in and help choke out other weeds and harvest them for their animals. They, rabbits love hollyhocks, and they're great for the birds and the hummingbirds uh, for pollinators. And uh, this is the the passion fruit died out, and uh, we had like 400 passion fruit every year for a couple three years, and then it died out. And um, in its place, we put uh, beans, scholar runner beans, and. Uh, lima beans, and we got a really nice canopy over the, the, the thermal mass. And then we had a nice harvest of beans. This is kind of how to, the, the tropical section. This is a red, um, Cuban red banana. And you can see up on the upper left screen there, that's um, Highlands papaya. Uh, that, that's, we use that in smoothies. We have four or five different kinds of papayas growing. And again, this is the passion fruit here when it was and this is our thermal mass and hammock and uh, place to hang out. The first year on the east side, we just grew annuals for the most part. And uh, we just uh, let the soil kind of digest and um, so you can move into your perennial polycultures in the greenhouse in whatever time frame you want, you know. And I, I, I have my archery range in there so I can shoot my bow Zen archery. Uh, I usually use a fig, a fig leaf or something for, for the target. And it's really strange because um, there's two different arrows here. I, I have two different bows. I have a practice bow, which is kind of this weird recurve thing. Uh, it's a 30 pound. And I have two sets of arrows because the, the arrows are, are spined differently. And uh, I picked up the wrong arrows because I shoot in the dark a lot. And I have a light over where the target is. And I picked up the arrows for the 30-pound bow, and I shot it with this, the 50-pound bow, and I hit all of them right in the middle. That wasn't supposed to happen, so I don't know. So everything works both ways in permaculture. So, so these are the different. Uh, we've had about six different racks of bananas. 
And then we have about 20 banana plants that we're sell that we sell. So we actually harvest a lot of propagation material. And when I go to Hawaii, I, I send back a lot of stuff and propagate that from seed or cuttings and stuff. We have a whole Hawaiian collection, taro, chaya, cassava, yakin. This is the Hawaiian, this is the Highlands papaya. And this is a new plant, that we're, this is a tropical Jerusalem artichoke. And it has huge, beautiful tubers that are so delicious you grate them in salads. And it's just an exotic plant. And the taro is too. I just love having that kind of ambiance that those plants, they just give off an amazing energy when, you know, they're, and they're so healthy and vigorous. And um, so, you know, not only uh, are they, um, you know, food production, but they're just, they're beautiful as well. And the cucumbers crawl up everything too. Key lime. We have six different kinds of citrus and three are fruiting now. My house is passive solar and uh, I, uh, I built it uh, almost 40 years ago with a grant from Carter and it's two clear stories and then I put the, the PVs on it uh, and I still get the sun in, believe it or not, I still get the sun in there in the winter time. Uh, and the swallows come and they nest there for the last 40 years um, and they help control the, the flies and the insects and, the, uh, and they are beautiful to have around. This is some of the harvests that we get in the fall, the different things, and we freeze a lot of things and uh, dry some. And this is Independence Day. I have a, a, all the seeds in our, our pantry with our tinctures and, uh, and all the food storage, and we have uh, our apples in there. So we, we order bulk food, and then we pretty much preserve what we need to eat. Solar dryers. And then uh, we're just doing a bunch of, that's Spilanthes down there. I have that for sale here. That's antiviral, antifungal, antigesic, antimicrobial. And it's also good for your gums and teeth. Spilanthes. It's a tropical little flower that um, you can grow as a house plant. And it's a magical medicine. We do about you know 15 different kinds of herbs and some combinations. So try to value add what we grow. <coughs> a lot of our herbs now are grow as understory. I have Brahmi growing under the, under the <coughs> papayas and uh, Yerba Mansa. This is something new that we're doing now. Um, we were building swales. This is above the one greenhouse you saw on a slope on the eastern slope. And we got uh, funding to do fire mitigation, to cut up, to limb up the trees to take some of the fuel out. And also there were some dead trees in there. So we opened up some of the pinion and juniper forest. And we got about three cords of wood. Plus we took all the slash here and laid it into windrows. And uh, instead of just doing a swale behind it, we turned it into a raised bed. And this is kind of hygge culture. I, I left uh, <coughs> Seth Holster's book out there. And this is a variation on what he does. This is Polish hygge culture. Uh, so, you know, we don't put logs in here. We put just the brush, and then I've, I've already got rye and clover and vetch and uh, different things growing in here. But we're going to grow our annual crops up in here, some potatoes and onions and things that we don't have room for anymore in the forest garden. Uh, so, again, uh, and then mushrooms. <coughs> lots of mushrooms are growing in here. And we're just creating soils all the time, always chop and drop, always bringing in material, putting it, running it through the animals, um, doing worm farms. We grow worms in our pathways in the greenhouse underneath pallets. We, um, we grow them in buckets. We grow them in piles. We grow them everywhere. They're outside in the forest garden everywhere. All winter long they live. All the red, the red worms winter over at my place. And uh, this is just some leaves we're bringing in. This is four or five cords of wood that's covered that we'll use for the, we bring in all kinds of different leaves. Willow leaves are good for making teas, for making a hormone uh, tea for uh, root development. So if you get willow leaves, ha hang on to them and make a barrel of tea out of them <coughs> and use it on your bedding plants in the spring. Okay, this is how we built the soil in Phoenix uh, with cheap mulching about a foot and a half of it. So we brought in some manure, some straw, and here we're using comfrey, horseradish leaves, Siberian pea shrub for the woody part, and just layering it. 
and uh, then we just planted right into it with one gallon pots of annuals. We could do per perennials in as well. And this is another business I'm involved in, the GOT machine. If you could just Google that, GOT, you can get, uh, see some videos about this machine. There's lots of different kinds of uh, compost tea machines, but this one has a pretty good reputation. In fact, um, this campus uses them here to, for all their fertigation. They're all tied into their, um, to the fertigation system here. And they're, at Harvard, they use them too. Um, again, you can make small barrels of compost tea, uh, but this, was, uh, this is a commercial model. And I've used this up at my place several times to deep root um, my trees and also do foliar feeding. And it really made a difference uh, this year. And we do water storage. We collect water off all of our roofs and use, pretty much use gravity. And the tanks are not only water uh, for the greenhouse, but they're thermal mass. So you get you know, extra bang for your buck that way. And we catch the water from the roof in smaller tanks, pump it up to the larger tanks, and then gravity feed it down into a drip system. Do you use plastic or metal in your tanks? Plastic. Uh, I've been buying totes. Uh, they're about 100 bucks a piece, so you can you know, clean them out, and uh, they're a lot cheaper than buying, uh, and you can put them in the corners and stuff. So the totes, those plastic totes you saw in the other greenhouse, that's a, uh, a good way to go with, for water, co water collection. And they're already plumb. They already have some fittings on them. Uh, I haven't used them enough to know they, they should be fine. Okay, we have uh, um, the second Sunny John that was built in Colorado is still functioning. We just cleaned out the uh, barrels. Uh, that's a solar and wind generated composting moldering toilet. Uh, has rock storage at the bottom. And we use the humanure on a certain part of the garden where we grow berries and trees. We don't ever bring it into the greenhouse or just so we don't have to deal with the, the health department. It's, don't try to use their, your, um, your humanure on your vegetables. It's, you set up a whole bunch of negative stuff. But just use it out where you're, where you're not going to contaminate or anything or have the potential for doing that. But it's basically worm castings. By the time it's a year and a half, there's nothing but worms in there because we put worms in the barrels and they eat everything up. Where do we get our, our, our model from? Where do we get our information from for, for designing and for inspiration? We get it from nature. Don't we? This is above my house. I, I take this walk about twice, twice a week all winter long even, um, and this is up through the pinions and junipers and then the sage and uh, up into the aspens. I have places I stop, different trees I visit. You can snuggle up in there. You can see the basalt mountain goes all the way up there. And then this is like uh, one of the springs that comes down from the mountain. This is like the vagina of the mountain right here. It's like, this is a very lush, uh, all these wildflowers and nettles and cow parsnip and just teeming with, and then it all dies back and it all comes back again. So it's like that's what we that's what we mimic when we do forest gardening, you know. And then uh, just passing on the information, we have lots of schools coming. We have our we'll be up to our 28th design course next year. Lots of kids coming up, different schools. We've done a lot of school projects in, in the valley as well, putting growing domes at schools. Stephanie will be here this week too, uh, this weekend, doing a presentation with, she's my manager. Now, ecosystem design, this is uh, our big commercial projects. This is our first big project in Steamboat, and now this is a, a million dollar project with two hoop houses out on the meadow, and big forest garden and an 80-foot greenhouse, and um, it, it turned out to be a pretty great project. This is what, uh, how the garden beds were designed on SketchUp, and then this is how they turned out. And then I brought the plants up. I grew them out at the same time. And I, I grew out the other plants, and then, and this is what it looked like, uh, you know, a few months later. Uh, and it's gone through lots of different uh, progressions of of different plants. Now they grow pretty much just perennials in here. And this is another project we have in our valley. 
which is a, a, sort of a CSA garden. It's, they just grow annuals. It's another, uh, and they have a community garden outside. This is the climate battery. See, we do these large uh, culverts that we use ADS pipe, and ADS pipe comes in all different sizes, and so, you know, everything comes off the shelf. You, know, you don't have to, you know, try to invent anything. You just use ADS. Big culverts that go to the four-inch pipes, then all the elbows come into the intakes. So there's four big intakes here and two exits there. This is how it looks like when it's going in. These are some aquaponic tanks in that same greenhouse. And this is what that greenhouse looks like when it's growing out. Uh, they, they've been doing, uh, they do uh, annual production pretty much for a CSA. And this is a, um, a forest garden that I did in, uh, over by Salida designed it at one of our classes, and that was the site where it was going to be. And we went out on a field trip, and then we did a little sandbox design uh, in the beginning, and <coughs> then we did a, a finished design with a whole bunch of um, integral other layouts and stuff. And then I, I grew out all the trees and planted it out, and I went back about six years later, and it looked like uh, that. And I went there about six years after that, and it's even, I don't have a slide of that one, but it's, it's a pretty nice project. This is one of our growing domes at, at the Roaring Fork High School. And we just put another dome up at, in Aspen, a 42-foot dome, put the climate battery in that. It's an Aspen tree. Uh, it's, this is Spilanthes growing in the polyculture there. Are the domes more cost efficient than a regular structure? You know, the domes uh, have a lot of potential. Uh, and with the climate battery, they're much more efficient, and they're definitely Mediterranean. Um, and we, we usually, now we're doing a climate battery and a, and a pallet stove in the domes. And you could almost go tropical, I think. Um, they're, you know, they, they have a lot of benefits because they can go up pretty fast, and they, you know, there's not a lot of uh, con concrete and construction. And, um, you know, uh, I think there's a lot of potential. And if you go on growingspaces.com, uh, they have a really good website. And uh, you know, we definitely, we, we've sold about, I don't know, a half a dozen domes, one in Canada. So we're kind of distributors for them too. But we put the climate battery in it. And now um, Chris has been putting the controls in this one here so that the climate battery is operated with you know, those new controls. There's, a, there's actually an acre of forest garden around that, and they use that food to go into the cafeteria. This is a commercial uh, nursery operation that we did uh, right in our valley. We put a big climate battery in this warehouse type nursery. We're using the outside cool air at night and having another damper that pulls that cool air and reverses everything and makes the, the soil a heat a cool sink for the summer. And we're doing that in North Carolina and different places where they need more cooling. Uh, I don't do that at my place because I'm 7,200 feet. This is like 6,000 feet. And they have, a, you know, it's a different situation. So we're actually experimenting with that and turning the soil into a swamp cooler with the climate battery. And so these are, um, this is my partner designed this for, they, the Eagle County would not let them build this greenhouse without the climate battery because it was going to be an energy hog if they used the conventional nexus greenhouse. So they made them put the climate battery in and it worked. And I wish Pitkin County would do that because they're doing a lot of marijuana grow houses now and we need to be putting the climate battery into marijuana grow houses but they don't care about it. They don't care about saving energy, unfortunately. And the, county, the counties are not making them do that. Uh, at least Eagle County is. but not Pitkin County. They're building these 50,000 square foot uh, grow houses and they're just sticking you know, propane tanks on them. You know? and this is the exits for this particular project here. And this is the grow house in, in, um, in Denver, uh, Adam Brock's project, and uh, we have a climate battery. These are the climate battery intakes for that group. For that. We, they took the slab out and uh, 
put the climate battery in and put the slab back in there and they're growing aqua hydroponics on top of that. But the climate battery helps to cool the greenhouse and heat it. Is it aquaponics or hydroponics? This is hydroponics, but they have aquaponics in another section that's very, uh, they have a very good aquaponics person there. This is for the, the grow house. Then uh, these are just some of the groups that we have up. Uh, lots of volunteers, interns, tours, our greenhouse workshops are, we do about four or five a year, weekend ones. We have the design course again this year. We have a course in Hawaii that we're helping sponsor. I'm going to Cuba uh, in two weeks to do a presentation there at the international conference there. It's my third one. I've been in Nepal and, and uh, Perth, Australia. And then when I'm not out in the greenhouse, I'm out sailing on my boat on Ruda Reservoir. And see, nobody, the, nobody's sailing the boat except for uh, the wind and the design. Um, I was just sailing last week, and we just pulled the boat out a couple of days ago. And eventually, we want to do permacultural float, which will be taking a sailboat and, and um, doing teaching off the sailboat, doing uh, permaculture in the Caribbean or whatever. That's kind of my. Um, really? Why not? I, we actually. <laughs> Rather than flying around, why don't we turn the lights on? I think we're. Do we have any quick last questions? We're almost out of time here, but. Does the, uh, the energy for the climate battery is you, that's generated by the uh, sun. The solar power. Sun. sun. See, when you close the greenhouse up, it gets very warm at 90, 100 degrees, yes. and um, the only way to get rid of that is to put it into the soil. We can turn the lights on and. But the electricity for the fans. The fans are, are solar generated because I have these 6.3 kilowatt. I sell back about, I bank about 800 kilowatts a year, and I wind up using it during the winter time. Uh, but I bank, I'm always banking electricity because I, I, I conserve a lot of electricity with, you know, turning off lights, right? And, uh, and turning off the fans when I don't need them. Uh, and so, uh, so that's how that works. These are some different strategies, uh, things that we go through to make it all work for us. And I'm going to go through some of our uh, greenhouses, uh, the five that we have on site and they all have different climates. And then we're gonna go through some of our commercial ones that we built uh, in Colorado and some of the climate battery technology that we built. Um, the first one is, is going to be uh, Shri, which is a temperate one. Then we're going to uh, Mana, which is my attached greenhouse is Mediterranean. Uh, then we have a, an attached greenhouse uh, onto our cabin, which is temperate. And then Phoenix is tropical and Core is Mediterranean. We don't encourage people to grow, uh, to build a greenhouse that's tropical necessarily, uh, unless you, you know, you're ready to spend a bit of money uh, or do your homework. Uh, but you can do a lot with um, just uh, season extending um, lean-to greenhouses, like let's look at Shree. So this is an, an, an attached greenhouse onto another greenhouse. It's actually western facing. This is a west wall here. And this is facing south. Uh, and it's just, you know, stuff I found at the dump and I attached it to the west side of my attached greenhouse, which is a Mediterranean greenhouse. But this is an early crop of spinach and brassicas. And then we harvest that and put in eggplant tomatoes and all kinds of stuff and grow stuff right up until we just we just uh, cut all the tomatoes out and they're on the counter now ripening uh, it's kind of nice to have all your tomatoes out there and you walk by them every day and they're every day there's new reds showing up and yellows and stuff and so we grow all our you know a lot of our tomatoes in these four season or these two season greenhouses because uh, I don't like to grow them in the tropical greenhouse um, and then we use that for wood storage. We use it for worm 
farming uh, we do in there, and then I bring in nursery and wake it up. Uh, so we put pallets down after we chop and drop everything. And so there's, there's a worm farm underneath the pallet, and then there's, bedding, there's nursery plants there. And we have about five months of fig season, and we freeze a lot of figs. And, um, this is a similar greenhouse attached to our cabin. Again, about $1,000 it cost me to build this. The only thing we bought was the rafters. Everything else came from the dump. Just recycled wood. Uh, and it's a double inflated poly, which is two layers of six mil. Go ahead. Inside, we grow um, assortment of herbs. And there's some perennial herbs in there. And uh, again, rotating summer crops and fall crops. Right now, actually, we're just growing one summer crop in here. And uh, if you can see on the left side, we, uh, we do our legal uh, intercropping uh, of three plants. <laughs> and they grow really well with, uh, it, that's uh, tarragon at the bottom, and there's kale, and, and there's comfrey off to the right. And then, you know, we're just actually jarring up the stuff now. This is our new project. This is a, a hybrid hoop house. You know, a hoop house would be totally glazed on all sides. And so we, we use the steel, which I salvaged uh, 15 years ago, and it was just uh, piled up above where the greenhouse is now. And then we, um, this is south facing here, and this is east. It just happens to be along the road here. And uh, there's venting here. There's a sliding glass door there. And uh, the west wall is uh, insulated, and the north wall is insulated. And let's go inside. There's gutters that will go into the, to the totes here and fill up for water collection. You see the, e the west wall over there is insulated with vents, and the north wall is insulated. This is a typical. Uh, Right now we're drying our grain from the brewery in there. So there's lots of different uses. And then after that summer crop gets done, we just cut it down, throw it on the ground, leave it on the bed there, and then put some stable cleanings on it. And then we put uh, some leaves on it and pallets on it. And then we can use that space for something else. Uh, I bring my nursery in there in the springtime and wake it up, and then I can graft on it. So this little space um, is very, very valuable. And most people you know, would have a shed like this, and it would just be full of junk and, and never get used, right? So we're using these things over and over again, different ways. And this is the cheapest and the simplest of greenhouses. But it's pretty, uh, my architect partner wants me to tear it down because it, he thinks it's an eyesore. And he says, we can never sell one of these. You know? Uh, you know, we can never you know, sell one of these for a million dollars. So. You know, so. I'd say, well, you know. <laughs> anyway, then this is my attached greenhouse. This is the second greenhouse I built. Um, it has a huge fig tree in it. Um, we plant a lot of insectary plants here to attract beneficials to go inside and bring in our beneficials for pollination and, and insectary bile control. And there's a 6.3 kilowatt power plant on the top of the roof, and it's also a passive solar home. So there's lots of layers of, of resilience there. Uh, you know, passive solar home, it doesn't need to be heated. Um, has a greenhouse on it. Uh, the realtors would never have uh, allow you to do that here in Boulder, because there wouldn't be any resale value for your house. But um, that, I've had it there for about 20 years. So early on, we grew a lot of annuals in here before the fig tree took over the whole place. And we still do some things in there, but this is tomato crop in the summer, and it would be, uh, you know, some brassicas or salad greens in the winter time. Again, this this greenhouse is allowed to freeze out, and see, you know, the fig is actually <laughs> taking over the whole greenhouse. But we still do things. We have rosemary, uh, pomegranate. Um, you've had some experience here with, you know, with the flooding, and uh, Austin had a huge flood, and uh, North Dakota had. Uh, four feet of snow, <laughs> uh, go on and on. There's a huge uh, typhoon in the Philippines right now. There was another huge typhoon in China a, a couple weeks ago. Uh, 
These are the kinds of things we're going to see with, with global climate change. And uh, when you go to Gary Naham's talk, he's going to be talking about all of the things that are happening in the dry desert climates and how that affects food production. Uh, I just finished his book uh, called Growing Food in the Hotter and Drier Climates. Very great stuff and a lot of stuff I'm incorporating into what we do because basically we, we're, in, we're in a high desert environment uh, on Basalt Mountain. We're, you know, eight, eight, six, 17 inches of rain. This year we got a lot more rain than we ever have gotten before, but we didn't get it the way you got it in Boulder. We got it in a very nice, even um, increment. So it was very, very useful. And um, with perennial gardens, you, you had your bets against any soil loss or contamination. So that's, that's the advantage of uh, the resilience of uh, doing perennial gardens. Um, it's like the forest doesn't really, um, it can handle, you know, 10 inches of rain better than uh, providing, you know, there's some good uh, understory and there's, you know, there's, it can handle it better than um, say an annual garden can or a raised bed gardens where most of that soil just gets washed away. Um, I mean, raised beds are great, and um, but if you don't have any plants on them, if you don't have any cover crops, you don't have any way of holding that soil, it's all going to be going down the street. So that's another reason for, for doing perennial polycultures and um, having lots of different layers and heavy mulches, ground covers, um, cover crops, all that, so that you protect your soil. So here's some shots of the drought in um, last year and a uh, huge amount of uh, devastation. Uh, a lot of the farmers got bailed out with some crop insurance, but uh, across the world where there's a lot of drought, you know, people don't get crop insurance and, and it's not going to help uh, more than one year because uh, this is what happened to me when they had four feet of snow up in um, North Dakota we got about four or five inches of wet snow. And since we had such a wet year, all the leaves were still on the trees and my whole forest garden was just hanging down. I lost a couple of large trees, uh, branches off some trees, but I had to go out there with a broom and shake, you know, shake all those things off. And fortunately, I didn't have any major damage, but uh, there's, you know, climate change can come in so many different ways. and. Uh, in the inner mountains, we're really protected, um, except for this situation here where um, usually the, you know, all of our leaves were two to three weeks set back this year. Like even the changing of the colors was set back. And, uh, and we're just starting to gather leaves now. It's just two or three weeks later. And, and most of the leaves are off on my apple trees and stuff, but um, they were, they were way late, uh, but we, we got through it. Again, um, there's resilience there. Um, and this is a shot of what happened here in Lyons, up near Lyons or up in that area. Um, we're not gonna, we just don't know what to, what to expect anymore. And I don't know how many of you heard about what happened in Austin, but uh, there wasn't that much press about it. But they had a huge flooding in, in, in the middle, in Texas as well. The greenhouses are a good way to protect your crops. Uh, 